Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Romy from Fairy God Boss. I'm so excited to be here today with Dr. Alexandra Sachs. I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to join since it's just 12.01 and it's a busy New York City day. So just hang on with us for a few minutes and we'll wait for everyone to join. Thank you. Hey, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm gonna kick us off here. I'm Romy Newman, I'm the co-founder of Fairy God Boss, and I'm so excited to be here today with our esteemed guest, Dr. Alexander Sachs. Dr. Sachs um, is a renowned effective psychiatrist, and she's an expert on a new concept for me, a new word for me, but a concept that I really survived called matrescence. Um, the idea is that there's this Incredible process that happens as we transition to becoming mothers. Um, and no one would know about this more than Dr. Sachs. She spent the last decade of her career helping women navigate their emotional lives um, after having children, which I sure could have used some help personally. She's a regular contributor to the New York Times, and she's the author of a book that will be coming out soon called What No One Tells You, A Guide to Your Emotions from Pregnancy to Motherhood. And she also hosts a podcast called Motherhood Sessions uh, from Gimlet Media. So welcome, Dr. Sachs. We're so excited to be here um, talking to you today. I'm Thank gonna you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm going to ask you to give us an overview of you and your work and your findings. Um, and then following that, we'll have a chance to do some Q&A, and everybody who's participating with us will have a chance to join as well. Wonderful. Um, well, thanks so much for having me. I've heard amazing things about this group and um, I'm now going to join it. Um, oh, I just, okay, so now the video is on me. I'm, I'm a little new to this, this uh, format. So thanks so much, Romy, for that introduction. Um, my name is Dr. Sachs. I'm a reproductive psychiatrist. And what that means is that I have specialty training working with women during pregnancy and in the postpartum period. Um, and I, you know, this is a really important area because while antidepressants are one of the most commonly prescribed medications for women of reproductive age, we really didn't have a lot of science about the safety of taking these medications during pregnancy and breastfeeding. And we know that when a woman is depressed, it not only interferes with her health and quality of life, it really interferes with the attachment experience and the child experience as well. So I was trained in that work but I was observing something different while I was going through my training, which is that a lot of women were calling me and, and approaching me and saying, I think I have postpartum depression. And so I would evaluate them or ask them a few basic questions. And it became very clear to me that these were not women who needed treatment. These were not women who were meeting clinical criteria for diagnosis. And I realized that Postpartum depression was kind of the only word, the only phrase people had to describe the experience of tumultuous transition. You know, Romy and I were just chatting um, before, the experience of identity crisis, the experience of tremendous change. And that is not an illness, that is not a disease that does not require treatment, that is absolutely normal. And how could you not change? when your body, your hormones, your mind, your relationships, the way you spend your time, the way you sleep has to dramatically shift when you welcome a baby and child into your life. Everything has to shift. It's like a kaleidoscope. And that doesn't mean that you have to lose yourself, but it means that 
in this change, in this transition, you're going to experience some forms of distress. It's, it's change is hard. We don't assume that change is kind of naturally flowing and blissful, though that is kind of historically how we talk about the transition of motherhood these days. Like, you follow your instincts. It's the best thing that ever happened to you. And you can follow your instincts, and it can be the best thing that ever happened to you. But it's also a time of tremendous transition. And matrescence is such a powerful word because of the analogy. It's used as a spinoff of the word adolescence. So matrescence, adolescence. And we know that teenagers, the, the image that is conjured when we think about adolescence and teenagers is kind of the awkward phase, the change, the not knowing, the growing. And we know that that's not illness. We know that that's a healthy form of development. It's, it's a struggle um, transforming from child to adult. But when teenagers are not, you know, totally together and comfortable in their own skin and knowing who they are and what they want. We don't worry. We say, oh, it's adolescence. So my goal is to have our similar framework for new motherhood and, you know, ultimately parenthood. Matrescence is a time when everything is changing. And if you're struggling, that doesn't necessarily mean that anything's wrong. It could mean that everything's going right and that you're just relating to the tremendous change. Now, postpartum depression is a separate thing, and some people who are going through matrescence also have postpartum depression, or what we're calling the PMADS, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. We still need to expand treatment and research for those patients. It's really important. It's still an underserved community. But I think the vast majority of people are not experiencing those clinical symptoms. They're experiencing matrescence, and the work that I've been doing is really a public health initiative um, through the TED Talk, through this book. Um, the podcast is much more sharing narratives. Um, the talk and the book are much more um, advice and kind of description, whereas the podcast is just like real women sharing their truths and showing you that you're not alone, whereas the book and the TED Talk will educate you about what matrescence is and explain that you're not alone. Um, so the book begins in the first trimester of pregnancy and it ends at your first year of motherhood. And it's really a description I, that I co-authored with Catherine Berndorf, a wonderful colleague. It's a description of the most psychologically charged moments that you may encounter. So it's, you can really think of it as expect I don't know, Romy, if my connection is still there. Can you hear me? Okay, great. So that's an overview. And, you know, we can absolutely gear the conversation to talk a little bit more about how this transition impacts work life. Um, and I think that's what Romy and I talked a little bit about today, focusing on. Great. Thank you. It, this subject matter is so fascinating to me because, as I was saying to you, I, I really feel personally I had this kind of identity crisis after I had my child, and um, a lot of the reason for that was was just becoming a mother, but then also a lot of it was sort of this dichotomy in my personal life between being a, a working professional and now suddenly like this docile like mother <laughs> and trying to be both and straddle both without a lot of sleep was very Thank you. Um, so I, I have. I, have I think we're in a really interesting time in our culture. I mean, I love groups like this that are organized around conversations about work, because I think we're in a really interesting time in our culture for women. You know, it's we're not we're not we're not equal equal on the dollar. We're not equal in a lot of ways, but we have much more opportunity than ever in generations before. And I think girls are being educated to develop their identities in full ways that are not um, dependent on gender norms. However, it's this conversation and experience around women are the one who traditionally carry the babies and give birth and then um, may be um, viewed as the primary caretakers, usually are in terms of cultural uh, stereotypes. But so how do we relate to that as women today where we've shown up in our identity um, being encouraged to develop all these parts of ourselves that the trope of the 1950s housewife is not who we, what we aspired for in college and our careers, but then motherhood arrives and it 
is so equally important, right? It's, it's not like an unwanted experience, but how do we sort of in our culture create conversations about how to integrate and reconcile the two? How to really talk more about partnership and how when a child is welcomed into a family, it is not just under the mother's purview if we're really thinking about men and women as being equal in our culture as contributing and equally important as parents. You know, it's also about valuing the roles of fathers. Yeah, and, and it's certainly an emotion I remember experiencing was, um, wow, now that I have this huge responsibility that I'm devoted to in my children, can I even, I, can I still have the career that I always wanted? Yeah. And suddenly this realization hitting me that I couldn't just, it was not business as usual. And it, especially crazy because for my husband, it was. He just, you know, who had been with me every step of the way, but then one day our paths diverged and he went back work and here I am with full responsibility for the child um, yeah. and you know work's going on without me and it was it's a very great yeah. experience so to that point I said to you that um, I didn't feel it was crazy enough to experience this but what I also thought was surprising that no one prepared me for any of it so let's talk a yeah. little bit about some of the things your book is called what no one what no one tells you so what does what are the things you think no one gets told <laughs> Well, so many things, but I think the, the largest thing is that this is not going to be a seamless transition. Um, why would it be? I mean, it's what's almost really fascinating if, if we sort of take a step back before what no one tells you is, what do they tell you? I think people talk a lot about been in our culture, it's easier to compartmentalize things into binaries, into black and white. And so, you know, motherhood is a good thing. It's not an illness. Pregnancy is not an illness. You're bringing, growing your family is not a bad thing. It's the circle of life. It's moving forward. Yes, that is all good. But it stirs up complex feelings, just like any relationship, just like the transition to marriage, just like the transition to a new job, just like the transition to moving out of your parents' home. It stirs up complicated feelings. So I think it's really threatening for people to talk about what's hard about motherhood um, because I think we're all afraid of being viewed as the bad mother. You know, I think that's pretty much like the most evil character we can think of out there in movies and in fairy tales, right? Um, the evil stepmother. And it's in admitting that you don't always like the work of motherhood, it's not the same thing as saying you don't love your child. And it's right. not even the same thing as saying you don't love motherhood. It's just saying, I, first of all, aside from balance and, you know, I love my career and how do I fit that in with taking care of the baby? It's one thing that people don't tell you is that ex the experience of early childcare and later childcare can be boring. It can be boring. <laughs> and... So um, un undiscussed by people that they, they worry if they're sitting on a play mat and it's the third hour and it's the four, fourth hour with your four month old and you're feeling understimulated and you're feeling like you might imagine being elsewhere or your old life, people feel really guilty, like there's something wrong with them. But no, I mean, in the fourth trimester, babies' brains are, are still growing, they're for, for the first few weeks, not interactive. It takes them a while to really develop visually and develop in terms of their ability to respond and play. So how could it be interesting to take care of a creature that doesn't even necessarily isn't able to relate to you at all? You know, it could be rewarding, but it might not always be stimulating. So that's a natural, natural um, experience in early caretaking. I think, you know, we could we could look at that kernel of ambivalence, kernel of it's neither good nor bad, and look at any moment in time during pregnancy and during the first year of motherhood and talk about this, this experience of ambivalence, what I call the push-pull. So I think what, as a larger theme, I mean, the book describes in 360 pages what no one tells you, but I think as a larger theme, what no one tells you is that most of the time you'll feel in the middle. And that feeling in the middle is a tremendous sense of feeling out of control and chaotic 
And in our current culture, which I hope changes, guilty. Because you leave yourself this lurking question, am I not cut out for this? Am I not generous enough? Am I not maternal? Which sort of means in our current tropes, all giving, right? And so this concept of when you're noticing that you have urges for yourself, ranging from relating to your work to going to the bathroom, right? It's this sense that I'm doing something wrong, I'm selfish. Yeah. But when you become a mother, you don't get to divorce yourself from your prior human needs. You're still a human, you're not a robot. And so you have to do this really challenging dance of relating to your baby, relating to yourself, relating to your partner, relating to yourself, relating to your baby, relating to your work, relating to yourself, relating to your baby, relating to your friends, relating to yourself, relating to your baby, relating to your sexuality, relating to your politics. You were all of these many beautiful things before this baby comes. And because newborn babies are so vulnerable and dependent, you know, we say that in the animal kingdom, it would take 18 months for a human baby to be as independent as a chimpanzee. You know, we have a lot that we need to pay attention to in those first 12 months of life. And the baby is at the center. It, it, there's, there's no other way to do it. It's such and, a demanding schedule. You, yes. And it's a 24-hour schedule, too. Yeah. Yes, and you spoke about sleep. I mean, sleep is one of the most, what no one tells you, I mean, this is advice. I, I really love to talk about sleep because I think it's so simple and practical. You know, it's obvious, but when you're sleep deprived, when you're jet lagged, you don't feel good. You may be more sensitive and more irritable. You may want to eat different things. We all know that. It's, it's a no brainer. Like you can say to someone, I'm jet lagged and, and they know that you're not feeling quite right. And, and you're probably not thinking in the same way as you normally would. And yet we expect mothers to go months and months and months with every two hours of interrupted sleep and still function. Now, maybe you can still function, but you're not going to always feel good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what no one tells you is that you have to, you have to protect your sleep. You have to talk to people who can help you in the beginning at night. You know, are you going to have your partner do a pumped feed or are you going to use formula or what are you going to do in order to get that? What we recommend is four hours of uninterrupted sleep is, is really, really helpful for brain health um, and stress hormones and all of that. So yeah, sleep, I think things that if oftentimes when people come to me in a crisis and I discuss with them kind of a strategy for how they're going to get sleep in a few days after, after even two nights, of sleep, um, a, a lot of their other anxiety and mood symptoms are totally transformed. Interesting. So to that point, let's talk a little bit about daycare and childcare mm -hmm. and yeah. and how, you know, what are the misconceptions around childcare and how does, and, and the emotions that women experience in this whole thing? Yeah, I mean, I think guilt is um, the primary emotion that um, is triggered around the childcare experience. And, you know, that first separation is very, very emotional. We as humans, we, um, yeah, we work emotionally in relationships. We're interpersonal creatures. And so you become attached and there's a primal attachment to your child oxytocin is the hormone that mediates that so separation is hard for all of us that's why some people find it scary to go on an airplane that's why you know some people find sunday night scary separating after the, the weekend of family time but this first separation of going back to work is like viscerally physiologically scary so who are you going to trust to replace you raises a lot of anxieties and in our culture, it's not helped by the fact that we don't have subsidized childcare and we don't have standardized, you know, like we sort of regulate seatbelts and um, food in the grocery store. We, we don't regulate childcare. So how do you, who do you trust? How can you afford it? And then how do you deal with that feeling of panic, which is going to come up in um, the early transition? I mean, even if in just a microsecond, I think, I think it's triggered for everyone in that separation. So 
then you add that to really complex sociocultural dynamics around childcare and the nature of the dynamics of who we are as mothers and domestic workers, you know, and issues around class and issues around race. And what does it mean if someone's coming into your home? Are they a part of your family or are they your employee? What if you've never had an employee before? What if you don't know how to sort of set up a contract with someone and talk to them about their paid vacation? Like, it's just your baby. You just, you just want to make sure everything's okay, but they're arriving to start a job, you know, and how do you relate around that? How do you relate if the person who you've hired as a child caregiver is trustworthy and great and very experienced, but you don't want them to be dictating things which, you know, there's so many issues in parenting that are stylistic where there isn't a right answer. Exactly how to deal with sleep, exactly how to deal with feeds. H how do you tell someone who has more experience with babies what to do if you're the mom? Or, yeah. we could go on and on. Or if you're a mom, and I think, I think we all have different kind of needs and different moments and different personalities, but I think some moms really want that kind of alpha nanny to come in and be instructive and share from their experience. And how do you, if your nanny is kind of waiting for you to tell them what to do and how to do the thing, how do you say, I don't know, you know, what do you think? And I want to learn from you. I mean, it, these are such scary moments um, because they're all compounded by separation anxiety. And so, you know, I think the, the one thing that I think is very helpful to, to educate people about is attachment and how attachment works. There is enough love to go around. Attachment is not like a lock and key where like when you have it with your baby and you go off to work and the nanny has it with your baby, then you're left out. That's not how attachment works. And we know that the more bonded your child is to their child caregiver, the healthier and more positively it is reinforced on the child's attachment to you because the, the child gets the sense wherever I go, whatever happens, I'm well cared for and I'm loved and I'm safe. And that increases their wellness and that enhances all of their relationships and all of their attachment bonds. So I think the first thing is if you find yourself feeling threatened by your child's positive attachment with a caregiver, um, take a step back and say, this isn't about me. I'm the mom. I'm irreplaceable. But it's a good thing if my baby is bonding with the nanny. That's, that is what my baby needs. And th that I'm going to see it as soon as the nanny leaves, like we're back, we're back in our groove. But, you know, try to remind yourself of that if you're feeling threatened by the, by your child's bond with the nanny, that you are irreplaceable. Um, and that attachment is not, is not a one way um, relationship. Um, and also, you know, I was just in a nanny conference. I'm pretty involved in the nanny advocacy movement. I was just at a nanny conference this weekend. I think also to try to Get, get a hold of your fears, you know, especially as they relate to separation. Or professional. But keep an eye on how much you're projecting onto them. Yeah. Because I think these fantasies of what if this person hurts my child? You know, I mean, we, we all know the world is a dangerous place, right? And part of being a parent is protection. But if your judgment is that this person loves children and that's why they've chosen this for a profession, then to sort of keep wondering, are they going to hurt the child? You have to, you have to step back and ask yourself, like, why would they do that? Maybe my feeling is I'm afraid of harm befalling on my child. And maybe I need to talk to my nanny about that without, you know, being suspicious and accusatory. Yeah. Well, I will also say, I think it's interesting because to your point, a young, a small baby is so vulnerable. I mean, like until you have a child, you've never known where you have to like spend every minute anticipating what could go wrong. Oh no, you yeah. want to try to make sure that they're, they don't hit their head before they hit their head. You've got to make sure they don't fall off the counter before they fall. You're constantly, you, and I think this contributed to a lot of anxiety for me. Your job as a new parent is to look around and anticipate disaster everywhere. Yeah. So partly, I think when you have a caregiver come in, you're, you're wondering if they're equipped to anticipate disaster. You know, are they, do yeah. they know that disaster looks, you, you're, you've been trained to be like, oh my gosh, there is disaster lurking around every corner. And is this person going to know <laughs> or be as aware that there's this disaster everywhere? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, different people relate to disaster. Like the truth is there isn't disaster working, lurking around every corner. I mean, that is how some of us, myself included, relate to the world. <laughs> but well, I think I, having a child, make, especially a young baby, who, you know, if you don't hold the head right, and if you don't do that, I should think I felt like if I don't do this right or I don't do this, maybe we're yes, yes, but Yes, but I think that's the feeling. Yeah. And you have to be hypervigilant. That's evolutionarily required because yeah. these creatures are so vulnerable. But you will see over time that if you don't hold the head right, like the baby's head adjusts and, you know, it was scary. You saw the head flop over, but like the neck is designed to tolerate that, you know, and they're not made of glass after all, mm -hmm. you know. And so how do you, how do you assess for safety and vigilant in a caretaker? But how do you also just articulate your feelings? Like, let's say it's a caretaker who, and I think so many of these things are culturally um, dependent, who maybe like, just, it's like, this is the 15th baby I raised, you know, I don't, right. I, this is, like, a right. yeah, you know, like, I'm careful, but like, there isn't actually disaster, like, like, we're just gonna have a feed and a nap and a change and like, nothing scary is gonna happen today, mom, like, it's not that big of a deal, you know, but how do you sort of say, um, I hear you and I respect your experience, but this is just how I feel right now. I feel like I just need to be so protective of my baby. And before I leave, I need to know that nothing, you're, you're not going to let any, anything bad happen to him because I'm that's my fear. I've taking this, care of this for three months and now I'm just like walking away from this hypervigilant thing. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to make sure that your caretaker is super safe and super vigilant but you know when you encounter a different personality style or a different cultural norm you need to communicate you need to communicate and you need to say you know some people are extremely careful but just laid back mm -hmm. so you need to ask you need to say you know what would you do if if um, the baby spits up like how would you handle that what would you do with the next feed ask questions go through your worst case scenarios and get reassured to make sure that they have good judgment but you can just talk it out about how you are feeling anxiety and you just want to know that how they would handle situations and you just want to know that the baby is going to be safe. And I think just, just owning your feelings and sharing them with the person who's taking care of your child is so helpful because then it's out there in the world. And I think there's so much non-verbalized communication that can It isn't articulated and the nanny has a sense like she sees a look in her eye but she has a sense like I think the mom thinks that maybe I'm stupid you mm -hmm. know and like maybe then the nanny starts to be a little bit you know defensive with the mom like over explaining you know that they know what they're doing so you just have to speak from the eye and say I am anxious about the baby's safety and just explain where you're coming from because these relationships are so complex they are all right, let's, I'm going to cover one more topic with you, and then I'm going to invite everyone to join us and have a, in the conversation. So there's a Q&A function on the bottom here to start contributing questions there. Right. Um, but while people do that, I'm going to ask you about another very difficult relationship situation that emerges after baby, which is yep. with your partner. Um, oh, yeah. So how, how do you think about mapping out Preparing for uh, maternity leave with your partner, which I, I didn't even think to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so many things to talk about. First of all, like talk about it. Don't assume that just because this your partner wants to be a parent and you're in love and you believe in the equal rights of moms and dads, don't assume that it's just going to fall into place because you've never done this before. You've never shared this type of an experience with your partner before. And you really don't know what's going to come out. You don't know what's going to come out in terms of their own kind of anxiety system, like how they relate to protecting their kid. You don't know in terms of their history. if you're giving up your salary and your partner is going to be the primary breadwinner, 
how are you going to have some private um, funds, you know, because it's a very different dynamic to have to ask your partner now for permission, right? Can I have some money to go buy a new car seat, new shampoo, new, you know, it's a very infantilizing position where when you've worked and earned money your whole life and you've given up your salary just because you're volunteering to care for your child, which means you're working at home. It's not that you're not working. You're, you have an unpaid job. You're working at home. So how do you maintain your integrity and, um, and experience lifestyle as an adult? And part of being an adult is having privacy, some privacy around your spending. Um, so how are you going to handle your bank account? Um, if there's, if, if you're giving up your paycheck, um, how are you going to handle the handoff at night? You know, when you've been home with the baby all day and your partner comes home, they've been at work all day. They may be missing you and excited to talk to you. They may want to tell you all about some stressful things that happen. They may be hungry. They may be just like wanting to sort of, um, decompress and have sex, but maybe you've been holding a crying human for six hours and haven't gone to the bathroom, you know, and the last thing you want to do is talk to another person, let alone be touched by another person. Okay. So how do you anticipate those moments and say, um, when are we going to reconnect in the week? Because the moments where we used to come together at the end of the day are going to be consumed by this sort of transition around childcare. And how are you going to come in and take over for the baby when I'm going off my shift? I encourage people to make a list. Um, it, you can do it after the baby's here, but if you, if you are able to during pregnancy, even better. And what are the rituals that you do in your week, both for yourself and for your relationship with your partner, that are the little things to that just make you feel like you? Do you, um, want, do you say, how was your day over dinner? Do you sit down and have dinner every night? Write it down. Do you have sex? Do you go, um, do you read the newspaper together on a weekend? Um, whatever it is, the tiniest things. Do you get to go work out um, and go to your yoga class on a Saturday and then you reconnect after? Like, what are the little things you do in your routine? Write them down, the things that you think are the mo feel the most good to you. It doesn't matter how small, but the things that you most treasure. Write them down because you will forget to do them once the baby's come. And it will be a, the third week where you haven't asked your partner, how was your day? And that's where the distance starts to, starts to grow in a relationship that pulls people apart, not even to mention decrease in sex. And you're also going to forget those little things for yourself. Like, let's say that part of your identity is reading the newspaper and you're someone who enjoys and just it's innate, innately someone who knows about what's going on in the world. If you're so busy taking care of a baby and, you know, sleep deprived and th there's just never enough time, you could go three weeks without reading the newspaper and all of a sudden you're sitting around and you're, and you're feeling, you're feeling a little bit depressed. You're feeling like this is not fun. You want to, you wonder if this was a mistake. Well, maybe it's because you haven't done something that's core and fundamental to who you are that you used to do every day in your life up to this point for three weeks. Maybe if you just looked at your list and read the newspaper, you'd feel a little bit like yourself again. Um, so I think writing that list is really, really important for both your individual self-care and your relationship self-care. And then the money topics, you know, I could go on and on, not to mention just different philosophies around discipline. Um, a common thing that people come and talk to me about is that they and their partner have a totally different um, style with sleep training. Um, you know, you're, you're spoiling him or, you know, you have no, you're just so cold. You're just letting him cry and sort of like how you project your own stuff from your own family histories onto the baby and onto kind of your fears about the baby. And will the baby feel loved and will the baby feel scared and will the baby get enough discipline or will the baby get enough space? You know, it's really, really normal for you and your partner to have a different approach um, and to kind of, Try not in the heat of the moment, not when the baby's screaming, not when you're exhausted, to talk about it and talk about, like, why does it feel important for you to have the baby learn how to self-soothe? Why does it feel important to you to have to, to hold the baby and soothe the baby? Like, what does that mean to you, you know? Because you're sharing a project you've never done before, and, and everybody's very emotional. Well, and there is just a, there is sort of like a full-scale reprioritization. I mean, you, you've previously been in a relationship where the joint tasks are like, 
clean the house maybe. You know, it's yeah. a couple hours a week instead of like this 24 hour a day job that you're tackling together. Oops. Hello? It froze, and I'm wondering if it's me. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry. I think we lost Dr. Saxmas. Oh, here she comes back. We got you back. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, I, oh, oh, you you moved. Sorry, I, I need to see if I could fix it. I didn't know if it was my Wi-Fi. I think it might have been mine. Okay, we're here. <laughs> we're back. Great. So, um, the moving yeah. from a two-hour week project to a 24-hour day project together. Absolutely. And just all the invisible stuff that make you a couple, that make you feel connected. It's very easy to stop doing those things once the baby arrived because you don't have time. But then your relationship's not going to work if you don't make time for it. If you don't, if you don't figure out how to maintain your connection and conversation and touch and all that stuff, you know, you, you have to, you have to make space for yourselves. And that's where it comes in with dealing with the guilt of like, how do you tolerate just like having the baby not always be the priority and, um, and make, make room for yourself both as an individual and in a relationship. Um, it's really, really important. And what I tell people is that it's, it's good for your child that you're tending your relationship because, you know, when you're not always, always helicoptering or snow, snow plowing around a kid, they have some space. They have some space to like explore their fingers and learn how to roll over and, you know, have their own imagination. And um, you don't always need to be stimulating your child. This goes back to the boredom issue. You don't always need to be stimulating your child in order for them to have healthy growth. It's healthy for them to also have some, some under stimulation at time and, and, and use that time to reconnect with yourself and reconnect with your partner. Yeah. All right, uh, we have a question from the audience that's a great question. And if others want to ch chime in, please do. So how can companies support matrescence? How do they, what should they be doing when, as women are coming back to work? Yeah, I mean, thank you for asking that question. I think that is the question we need to be asking in all different venues every day. You know, as a psychiatrist who works with individuals, um, I'm not an expert in corporate structure. Um, so I have ideas, but I'm really hoping that my content inspires the consultants out there and the organizational psychologists out there to start these conversations conversations because I think honestly I think they're they're not they're just not conversations that space is being created for in most companies like what are we going to do to support mothers preparing for maternity leave and coming back you know I, I have all sorts of thoughts about that but just how about like having that be um, a, a, a on the agenda you know just even the discussion and acknowledgement of it you know I think there's a history of saying like don't talk about your family stuff at work because you'll sort of come across as not serious, you know, and, and you don't have your eye on the ball at your job. But so who is it? Who is it in HR? Like, who is going to lead this conversation? I'm trying, um, but we need to be just spearheading more conversations in companies about it. So I think it on the agenda. And then, of course, there's the issue that here in the U.S., women are going back to work in this phase when in reality in Europe, most women don't have to go back to work. They're sort of through a lot of this by the time right. they get back to work. Right. I mean, we don't have enough time off. We don't have universal paid leave. I think paternity leave is really important because I think that if fathers and partners are not given time to bond with the baby and learn how to take care of the baby, how are they going to feel like an equally essential parent? I think it's depriving them of a bonding and learning experience, but I also think it sets the imbalance of um, mental load and emotional labor, where if you're the one who's changed a thousand diapers and your husband hasn't because they didn't have leave, you're all of a sudden better 
at doing the changes. And then, you know, it's on and on and on with you doing the primary of the domestic work when that may not be what's best for your family. That may not even be what your partner wants, but you know, they need time too, supported by their jobs to learn about how to take care of the baby and bond. Um, I, I mean, there are some simple things that I recommend. I, I recommend that and I, I have more advice geared, geared to the employees than the company, but I recommend to women, um, take as much time as you're offered. Um, it's so common to not know what you're going to want to do. Um, just in terms of this identity shift, first of all, you don't know things like if you're going to have some sort of like birth injury where you're going to need to spend your first two months physically recovering and then it's month three and you haven't really bonded with your baby yet and you're not ready to go back to work. You know, you just don't know exactly how you're going to feel on your leave. You might love this time with your baby. You might need a lot more time than you expected. You might um, be recovering and, and just missing your job so much that you want to go back early. You might want to shift things and leave your job. You might want to transition to part-time if that's possible. You might have an awakening, which is like, now that I have so much meaning in this role of caretaking my child, I realize that I'm not generating meaning for my job and I don't, I don't, it's not worth it to me, even financially, to leave my child. You just don't know what you're going, to, where your identity in terms of your work is going to take you. Um, before the baby arrives. And so I, what I recommend to people is take the maximum benefits that you can get. Um, try, I, I really do encourage people to not tell their work that they're not coming back, even if that is kind of on your hypothetical. Just give yourself as wide of an option as you can for having choices after um, your time with the baby. Because I, I would go one step further, which is if you had, I, I found this anyway, which is I, I wasn't sure. And I think if you have any doubt, you should at least try to go back because the uh, anticipation of going back and even the first week of it is so much worse than what it really becomes. Yeah, and you can always leave a job. Exactly. You know, I think it has so much to do with feel, fear of failure, right? Showing up and just not being the version of yourself that you used to be. You know, and again, this goes back to black and white and creating a binary, like I'm a stay at home mom. This is what's important to me now. Um, I'm gonna pour all my energy into this. You know, I'm not going back to work. So th those are very clear categories, but those categories may not actually capture who you really are. Um, you may be someone who's immersed in motherhood um, and not sure about your career, but um, you maybe wanna have some role um, still in your office and um, it may come back to you once you're there or you may want to find a new role but it's like showing up in that gray can feel shameful for people and you know how do we create spaces in corporations where women can come back and say I don't know yeah. you yeah. know like I'm figuring it out um, and then there are the more practical things that I think other people talk about like just like how do we deal with the end of the day and pick up and you know hand off with, with daycares or child or, or, or with child care workers in terms of like when the day ends, how to, how to co-parents, mothers and fathers deal with who has to leave work first. Um, so I think, you know, I would love there to be child site at companies. I mean, I could go on and on about how we could improve things um, for working parents in America. Um, a good follow-up question is, how long does the crescence last? Like, when do you identify that phase? Yeah, I mean, it's not an exact science. Just like with adolescents, you know, some we say that some people who are still kind of financially dependent on their parents in their early 30s or in a late adolescence, it's it's not a um, it's not an exact science, and it's 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 sort of a word that you know I'm 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 repeating from a medical anthropologist and lots of other clinicians are using now. It's a word that I think we're using as to open the conversation about the identity transition. But I think for some women, your matrescence begins when you're um, with your partner and you, you're not, you don't want to have a child right now and you're, and you're making a decision like this isn't the time to have a baby. Maybe you're on birth control. Um, maybe you have a termination. Like that is a matrescence discussion in your head. When am I going to be ready for motherhood? You know, I think a, 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 an incredible surge of matrescence happens when children leave the home and move, move away and go to college. That's, an, that's an, a profound identity shift. And it often coincides with the hormonal shifting of menopause. So I think there's so much to discuss here in terms of 
how identity um, is sort of swirls around motherhood. And um, I, I think it's different for everyone. And, um, and, I, and I'm not sure it's ever over. No, got it. Um, okay, so how do you recommend broaching the conversation with your partner if you both are undecided about having kids? How do, how do you think about moving from that pre, <laughs> pre phase when you're just a couple having a great time to having children? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, no one's ever asked me that question before. I, I, I so appreciate it. I mean, I think I um, encounter people who are struggling to get pregnant or um, already pregnant or dealing with the aftermath of childcare, this contemplative thing. You know, I guess as a psychiatrist, as a, as a therapist, I would say, um, if you and your partner don't know, if you want to have kids, live in that. Live in not knowing. And I think that's your answer right now is that we're together. We know we want to be together, but we don't know if we want to have parents. I think it's important that people have permission to conceptualize a life, a life where they don't have kids, um, if that's really what they want. And sometimes not knowing leads to waiting. And sometimes biology makes the decision for you. Sometimes you don't know. And then you're sort of forgetting to use a condom and then you're pregnant and you're like, well, I guess I'm going to have a kid now. I mean, I hear that from women all the time where they don't know if they want to be parents, but they make certain decisions that lead to pregnancy. And that's their answer. You know, sometimes it's just too scary to, to say it, say it clearly because the ambivalence is absolutely normal, but your actions may guide you. But I think, I think there are so many things in life where we don't know and to allow yourself to live in that. There's almost none where we do know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I totally agree. I think I think, you know, do you know that your partner's right for you? Like, well, you hope they are. Some people are really unsure and some people are shocked to find out that their, you know, dream partner is not who they thought they were um, 10 years later. So it's, it's, it's the not knowing it is, it is allow for yourself to be in that space and try to not scrub it away. Like see where your feelings take you and see where your actions take you. Right. Okay, so um, the next question we have here also makes me think we might be scaring the audience. <laughs> um, but how does this occur with every pregnancy, or is this just a first baby thing? Is the question? Yeah, I mean, I I think in terms of the this, like this is not scary. This is not big and bad. This is just what happens to everyone, and it's different from the social media picture of your glowing, you know, mom who's never struggling. This is just, you know, human stuff. It's, it's, this is, it, it, it's, it's nothing that you have to be scared of. Um, it's going to be similar to other major life transitions you've had. It's just, it's not going to be perfect and it's not going to be only blissful. That's all this is. So please, yes. please try to not panic. Um, <laughs> Um, it's just, this is human and this is going to feel just like other parts of life that are good and bad. Right. I, and as I said to you at the beginning, I just wish I had been, I just wish somebody had told me that, you know what, this is, there are going to be really hard moments. And so now whenever I have friends who are pregnant, I say, listen, <laughs> you're probably going to have an identity crisis. So just be aware because otherwise I think it would felt more shocking when I started feeling that way, that I was feeling that way. And I think I would have felt a lot better knowing others did. Yeah, and I think I would I, I would um, see if the word, if the phrase identity transition because maybe it's not a crisis if you're well prepared for it. If other people say, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have to reassess all these things, and you may not know, and it's gonna be like, where'd my old self go, and who am I now? And you know, if you know that that's normal, if that's normalized, then maybe you won't feel that it's a crisis. Maybe you'll be like, okay, I'm in my matrescence transition. This is an identity transition, and everything's all over the place. But the, it's not a problem, right? Yeah. But I would also add that I think it, uh, with the second child, because you've experienced it, a lot of things are smoother because you personally have that experience and you personally know what you're doing and you're also less nervous. But then there's also a whole other thing that you're learning about managing two children at once. Right. It's, it, it's different for everyone. Yeah. You know, I was just talking to a mom for the podcast who feels really sat she has such a special bond with her first baby and she wanted to get pregnant with her second but she just feels so sad about losing that time that one-on-one -on -one time with her first and 
Um, and she's like so disoriented because she's happy to be giving birth to the second baby, but she, she's feeling a tremendous sense of loss. So she wanted my advice, you know, um, it's, it's just so different. You may be at a different place in your relationship with your second. You may have had to go through fertility treatments with your second. Um, you may have a different birthing experience. Um, I think it's, it's different for everyone, but I would say, yeah, I mean, I would say everyone goes through this with every pregnancy because what this is, is just a transition. What this is, is a complex demanding experience. And like, I've never heard of a pregnancy or motherhood journey that wasn't demanding <laughs> and, and intense, both happy and joyful and, and also at times difficult. I think everyone experiences motherhood as a big deal. <laughs> exactly. Because it is in the it, best way. It should be. I mean, come on, people. Like, it's a good, it, 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 it's, it's not a bad thing that you're just orienting to this tremendous moment in your life. It, it should be a big deal. Good. Good. Excellent. Well, Dr. Sachs, this has really been incredible. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I hope everybody got a lot out of it. I hope everybody checks out your book. Thank you. Yeah. And well, I just wanted to remind people that they can come find me on my website, alexandrasaxmd.com, and they can learn more about my book and podcast there. And you can also find my email there. Feel free to ask me questions if you didn't want to share them with the group. You can also find me on social media. Um, we're people at Alexander Sachs MD. We're, we're, it's, I am so in awe of the Instagram community that has sort of organized here because people really share hard stuff and so it's a it's a place that i think is really supportive for feeling less alone um and um where where you're where you're going to hear that other people are going through a lot of the same things yeah i love it dr Sachs. thank you so much for spending time with us and i know i will be looking for your book and your webinar and also referring my pregnant friends to it so thank you so much thank Wonderful. you so much and thank you so much for all the work that you're doing in the supportive community you have I'm, I'm really happy to now be a part of it yes thank you so much bye bye, -bye.